Hello and welcome to this course on the metaphysical poets. Uh, the metaphysical poets. Why the metaphysical poets? Well, I think, you know, was, any reason's good enough, but uh, for, for me to study the metaphysical poets, I mean, this is a, you know, this is an important moment in English literature where English poetry really came into its own. It really started something very new, even more than Shakespeare, you could say. Shakespeare was, almost was a precursor to the metaphysical poets, though he was still working in a, in a kind of older tradition of English poetry. And the metaphysical poets, um, and the, you know, there are many metaphysical poets or people who can be called metaphysical poets, uh, the primary ones we'll look at in this course are John Donne, George Herbert, Richard Crashaw, Henry Vaughan, and Thomas Traherne. There are others we could do as well. I mean, Andrew Marvell is one often. But I'm sticking with, with these because they really, uh, for me, form the core of this idea of metaphysical poetry, primarily in the way for, for, for those these five poets... Uh, Poetry is a vehicle for knowing God, uh, not only for the poet, but for the reader of the poetry. And uh, there's a lot, so much we'll go into in, through, throughout this course. Um, I should point out that this idea of met, the, the title, Metaphysical Poets, uh, doesn't quite fit what they're doing. This is a a name given to them by uh, Samuel Johnson, the great literary critic, and it was not uh, meant as a compliment. Uh, he, he, uh, looking at their use of conceits, in particular of John, John Dunn and Ab Abraham Colley, who uh, uh, Johnson was writing about, that, uh, <laughs> you know, as we'll see when we get into John Dunn in the, in the next two uh, lectures, he was so extraordinarily gifted intellectually and had such a, a you know lightning quick mind and his mind was able to range over all kinds of ideas and I, I always think of him as a super collider it was a super collider of, of thoughts and images and ideas and he just thrust them all at each other and they came in and they created this new kind of poetry and Ben Johnson I thought he was a great I thought Dunn was a great poet but he didn't think he would be read in the future because of his difficulty. Uh, strangely enough, uh, Ben Johnson's the one who's not read so much anymore, which is a shame. He's, especially his plays are f phenomenal and so deadly funny. But uh, but John Donne is read, you know, at least in uh, undergraduates always encountered John Donne, even of just a few poems, but they always read him. Not so much with John, Ben Johnson, but it's part of the changing taste and changing politics of time, I suppose. Now, so I mean, in this lecture, I'm going to give you some background and a couple examples of some kind of what we could call uh, precursors to the metaphysical poetry. I mean, definitely poets who influenced Dunn and and helped change the course of, of, of English poetry. Now, f first of all, you know, we have to set them in, in, in time, and this is really uh, very late, but mostly early first half of the 17th century kind of poetry. Uh, what, why, why then? Well, because we had to wait for Elizabeth to die, you know, part of it. Uh, the during Elizabeth's reign, there was a real effort for uh, literary figures, poets, writers, to create an English literature. Because until that time, really, uh, English literature was based on Italian models, especially, but you know, mostly foreign, and it was it did not come into its own. Uh, Sir Thomas Wyatt, for instance, uh, and he, we could also throw him into the precursors of metaphysical poetry. He was the first one to bring the Italian sonnet into English. And he, he, he lived during the, the reign of Henry VIII. 
Um, and he also worked with paraphrasing the Psalms. He, he paraphrased the penitential Psalms. Uh, and he did more than, I mean, in, in his, his paraphrases, he was more than paraphrasing the Psalms. He was actually depicting his, uh, his position and his situation. He was, he was imprisoned by Henry VIII for being, a, for suspected of being a lover of Anne Boleyn, which he was. And the, his, and Wyatt's penitential Psalms kind of explore that relationship, but, well, because he's speaking about David and Uriah and Beth, Bathsheba. <laughs> so, so you can't say, well, it's not about me, it's about the Bible, it's in the Bible. Uh, and he was in prison. In fact, uh, Henry VIII put Wyatt's uh, prison cell facing the square wherein Anne Boleyn was beheaded, so he was able to watch. Talk about talk about a nice king right now so 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 this is part of the background um in the in the rise of a protestant english identity you know because you really have to think that uh even though henry the eighth had named himself the, the the head of the church in england he was catholic <laughs> he was basically catholic he was just fed up with uh, church politics for, whatever, for better or worse uh but then he dies, Edward takes over, Edward dies, Mary takes over, so the crown passes before, it was Protestant, it's not, it was Henry who's kind of a pro pro protesting Catholic, to Edward who's hyper Protestant, Calvinist, to Mary who goes, takes it back to the Catholic Church but she doesn't live long, and then her sister Elizabeth is, is named uh, sovereign and she re reigns for 45 years. So there's this uh, desire to create an English identity in literature. Now, this was happening, especially in the in the later decades of the 16th century, with with drama. But you have to think that drama was not uh, was popular entertainment. So there was it was not considered literature literature, even though uh, it was wildly popular. But it was wildly popular with uh, every class in society at the time, right? Which is why, you know, they always talk about uh, Shakespeare throwing in uh, jokes for the groundlings so they didn't get bored and start causing trouble during the play. So, but there, there was still not considered high literature, even though we certainly consider it high literature now. Um, so there was a need to create this, this literature. And I would say the two figures... Uh, most important in that time as, as kind of uh, mavericks of creating this this English literature were uh, Sir Philip Sidney and um, Edmund Spencer and Sidney Spencer did it by uh, by volume I mean the fairy queen is you know this is we're laying out English literature right here this is how this starts now and of course, he uses the Fairy Queen, which is partial uh, to some degree, uh, an honorific of of Queen Elizabeth, right? She, who is who styled herself the Fairy Queen. But on the other hand, it's grounding English literature and English history in a Protestant uh, take on the Arthurian legend and the and the legend of Saint George. So it's kind of an interesting work. Uh, Philip Sidney, and for his part. Um, he, and he didn't live very long. He was 32, I believe, when he died. Um, but he was an ambitious little fellow. And Sidney, first of all, wrote this extraordinary poetic sequence, Astrophil and Stella, which is really, shows he, he was really dedicated to invention, to finding new forms, to, exp you know, he would write sonnets, but he was taking sonnets into new directions, trying to see, you know, you could expand the sonnet. We're, instead of having iambic pentameter, we'll have iambic hexameter. And we'll do other things. We'll change the volta. We'll put the volta, which is the, the last six lines in a sonnet, we'll put that in the front. And we'll make the octave in the back, you know. So he's just bending it and pushing it to see what, what he can do with it. It's like a, almost like a, like a race car driver, you know. You gotta see what kind of, what you can do with this thing. Um, and, but also, um, 
for Philip Sidney, what, another thing he did is he wrote his apology for poetry. And it's almost uh, a kind of romantic notion of the role of the poet in, in society. You know, it anticipates certainly uh, Percy, Percy Shelley's uh, observation or insight that the poet is the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, and Sidney would have been in total agreement with this. And he goes through all kinds of. Uh, he's definitely still working with uh, Latin and Greek models, at, but he's not content to rest with those. And he even, you know considers introducing Greek meters into English verse and lots of different things like this. But what's important is he sees the role of the poet, you know, vates, the prophet, as well as the historian, as well as the, the maker of ideas. And for, for, for Sidney, uh, in, this, in this work, he, uh, he says that poets are makers. And this is, this is the closest thing to the imitation of God. This is, this is the this is the best job next to being God <laughs> in the universe because you're a poet, you make universes. Even though they're not substantial universes like that, those created by God, you're still making universes. So it's a pretty incredible story. Um, a pretty uh, incredible project, too. Now, part of his incredible project and where really he becomes... Uh, uh, precursor of the metaphysical poets is a project he took with uh, the Psalms. And it was very, very uh, popular in the early days of um, printing, the printing press, to put out editions of the Psalms. And people, you know, now that the the Mass was in, in the vernacular in England, you know, in, the, in the Anglican Church, um, people wanted to pray the, pray the Psalms in their own language or sing the Psalms. And there were different Psalters that came out. The, the Sternhold Hopkins Psalter is one of them. And they're really crummy translations and clunky and not beautiful at all. And Sidney said, no, man, this is, <laughs> this is the Bible and poetry. So we have, to, we, have to, we have to make it, we have to treat it with that dignity. This is not, these are not songs to be sung in the bar, you know, in the pub. So what he did is he undertook this project to... Uh, do versions of the Psalms. And he wanted to do all 144 Psalms. The, the interesting thing is he only he didn't make it that long because he died young. And <clears throat> he died after he had completed the 43rd Psalm. So, so there goes that project, right? No. Because his sister, Mary Sidney, Mary Sidney Herbert, the Countess of Pembroke, she, she, she was her, her brother's greatest fan, and she promoted him you know, after his death to be you know, like basic, basically the English patron saint of poetry. And so she was really promoting this. She's well-connected in court as well. Um, and so she took up the mantle. She finished the book for him. And what's interesting about the, the Sidney Psalter, as it's known now, is each psalm, is written in a different form. Not one form repeats. You know, so he was inventing, he was using some of the extant forms that were available to him, like the sonnet, for instance, but, or, and she too, but they were, everyone had to be different. You know, so this is a, a not only is it an experiment in Protestant uh, religious uh, writing, right, the vernacular, but also it's an assertion of the English identity as a literary identity, right, of invention, you know. And unfortunately, you know, he died at 32, but his, his sister lived for quite a while afterwards, and she finished the job. It, but another thing you need to understand is in those days, such manuscripts were not published. I mean, the Sidneys did not need money. So especially Mary Sidney Herbert did not need money. You know, so they wouldn't publish for money. That was something commoners did. Like uh, Spencer was a commoner. So he published for money. You know, that's how he made his living. But it was really looked down upon by the lower upper classes to try to do things for money or publishing. So what happened is these would 
would uh, circulate in manuscript. And so handwritten manuscript, right? And people would make their own copies and, and, and they circulated this way, but it really reached quite an audience. It's been compared, um, this manuscript culture that was going on, coterie culture it's also called, is that this manuscript culture we could compare to theater now, right? Not, it's not like there, there's no theater. Every, every town has a theater, but it's not as big as the film industry. So you had this manuscript culture, which we can compare it to theater. And on the other hand, you had publishing or also plays, which were more popular for popular consumption. And there were a lot more available out that way. So they, they were kind of concurrent. But one was kind of a very specialized audience. Like today, theater is very specialized. Shakespeare's Day was popular entertainment. Uh, so, so that's one way to look at it. But very uh, influential piece of writing, this uh, Sidney Salter. And so, so, but here's, to back up a little bit, now this is what Sidney was doing. While he was doing this, though, um, English poetry at the t during the reign of Elizabeth with was as you can see with the the, the fairy queen um, is is essentially a form of praising the queen because Elizabeth liked to keep her, keep her courtiers close close at hand and basically they would write poems in praise of her beauty of course she's you know she looks horrible her teeth are rotten but they're praising her beauty you know why because she's in power, that's why. And she calls the shots. And uh, so that's what English poetry was, and it was still so stuck and weighed down by classical allusions to Eros or Venus or whom, whomever, right? So the English poetry of this, this time is really weighed down by this stuff. And um, Sidney... By taking the Bible as his example, he's not going to weigh his poetry down with classical allusions, uh, to be antithetical to, to the text with which he's writing, and and this inspired other other people, right, to do something differently. Now, almost no one was—I well, shouldn't say no one—very little religious verse was written in the uh, in the latter half of the 16th century. I mean, there was religious first, but it was not like it, like what happened in the 17th century. And, and the, the interesting thing, though, is that um, there were pockets of resistance. And where would you find resistance to English culture? It, it was becoming more and more, I guess, Protestantized and secularized to a degree, well, you would find it from Catholics. And in particular, the Catholic you find resisting this trend in English poetry was the Jesuit priest and martyr Robert Suthel, actually, who's called St. Robert Suthel now. And Robert Suthel, he was, he was from a Catholic family, but they were not too committed. And he escaped to go to seminary on the continent. He ended up in, in Rome eventually, at the English College in Rome, where they were trained to be missionaries to their own country. And so he smuggled himself as against the law to be a Jesuit or even a priest in England at this time. So he smuggled himself into the country and he was ministering to the needs of, of English Catholics in hiding. And you probably, I don't know if you've seen television shows or read things about this, but they had, I mean, if you were caught with a, a patent or a chalice, it was a death sentence because um, Catholics were seen to be uh, in opposition to the queen, which is the charge of treason, right? And so, so here's Suthel, he's a young man, he's in his 20s, smuggles himself back into England and he writes, and he writes poetry, religious poetry, but it's not overtly Catholic, but it's, you know, there are definitely Catholic elements. If you're looking for Catholic elements, you'll find them. But he doesn't sign his name. They give a phony uh, publication, place of publication. They said it was in France, it was in England. And 
what I want to point out is what he did is he writes in one of his manuscripts, which this this piece, and it was published eventually, this piece called The Author to His Loving Cousin, which is included in, uh, in your packet. But I'll just read the beginning of it because it's pretty important. He says, Poets, by abusing their talent and making the follies and feignings of love the customary subject of their base and endeavors, have so discredited this faculty that a poet, a lover, and a liar are by many reckoned but three words of one signification. But the vanity of men cannot counterpoise the authority of God, who delivering many parts of scripture and verse, and by his apostle, willing us to exercise a devotion in hymns and spiritual sonnets, warranteth the art to be good and the use allowable. And therefore, not only among the heathens, whose gods were chiefly canonized by their poets in their pining divinity, oracled in verse, but even in the Old and New Testament, it hath been used by, by men of greatest piety in matters of most devotion. Going back to the city, it's all a bit, right? Christ himself, by making a, making a hymn the conclusion of his Last Supper and the prologue to the first pageant of his Passion, gave his spouse a method to imitate, as, as in the office of the church it appeareth and all men a pattern to know the true use of this measured and f footed style. But the devil, as he affecteth his deity, and seeketh to have all the compliments of divine honor applied to his service, so hath he among the rest possessed almost most po also most poets with his idle fancies. All right, so he's basically saying, poets, you can do better. No. And he's he's pointing to love poetry, which is certainly always always a, something poets are writing about. He said, "Well, can't this be for something more?" Almost like a Saint Augustine mo moment, you know. Um, you don't know. In the early church, the preaching wasn't a very popular enterprise in the early Catholic Church until Saint Augustine, a professor of rhetoric, showed that uh, rhetoric, the power of persuasion, could be used to benefit the gospel. Right. So, so this is kind of, basically, uh, Suthel is throwing down the gauntlet. Now, Suthel was executed in, where did I go? Suthel was executed in 1595. So, so Elizabeth is still, still reigning at this time. And so, this kind of verse was still kind of underground, right? And his was circulated um, in a way underground from an underground press. And uh, he's, it's not until uh, Elizabeth dies in 1603 and James becomes king of the authorized version of the Bible that, <clears throat> pardon me, that, that then things change. There's no longer the pressure for courtiers to, to be sycophants to the queen, and James was not into poetry like that. Um, but James did con consider himself uh, a kind of a theologian, kind of an armchair theologian, so it, it became cool or accepted to write religious verse. There was a, some people, and I, uh, I kind of see it, don't totally agree, uh, that the idea of writing religious verse during the reign of Elizabeth was for courtly losers, which I see where, where, where people come up with that, that theory, scholars come up with that theory, but I, I don't think it's totally true, but it's mostly true, because most of the people writing poetry at, at the court were apple polishers. And so, so there's uh, Robert Suthel, uh, and we'll find out next time that uh, Suthel, I, I'm pretty sure, knew John Donne, and John Donne would have been... A, a, boy at the time. Um, I just noticed I dropped one of my books. Now, um, another person who was kind of a precursor, even though he's, we could probably call him an early metaphysical poet. Let me grab the book I dropped. Was William Alabaster. Now, I let, you know, Alabaster, boy, he, he's, he is not taught any, almost any place. And I think he's a wonderful poet. Interesting human being, too. He was an Anglican priest. And then he was imprisoned because he became Catholic. 
and then he became a Catholic priest. And then he eventually went back to the Anglican Church. I'm mostly, mostly political, and it's interesting, you'll notice with these metaphysical poets we'll, we'll examine, there's a interesting dynamic of crossing over between Catholic and Anglican, and even those, pardon me, who didn't officially change over, certainly had some uh, inclinations in that direction. Maybe Thomas Traherne is the, is the one uh, exception. He wrote a book called The Roman Fortress, which was kind of a polemic, anti-Catholic polemic, which is weird because uh, Traherne is the most non-polemic writer in his poetry and, and his centuries, you can imagine. Nevertheless, um, the, you know, and it might be that our, our uh, historical view of Protestant versus Catholic uh, colors our understanding of, of their age because I think there was a lot more porosity between Anglican and Catholic uh, than their subsequent years did, uh, especially after after the 17th century. You know, when <laughs> when uh, after the, the Glorious Revolution, it was it was it was over for Catholics in England for for a long time. Until that point, there was still possibilities. That's what you know. One of the uh, eruptions, I guess we could call the gunpowder plot uh, during the reign of James. Because James, when he came to power, he kind of indicated they would, he would have leniency and tolerance for Catholics, but he clamped down instead. And, and the gunpowder plot was a response to that. You know, when they blew up the Houses of Parliament, they, they were trying to anyway. They, uh, they were pretty uh, disgusted with the government. Catholics, uh, of Guy Fox and his, his conspirators. Um, but to go back to William Alabaster, interesting character, and he, while imprisoned, he wrote these these uh, holy sonnets. Now later, um, John Donne himself wrote a series of holy sonnets, and and the one I'm going to read right right now from uh, Alabaster has echoes in one of. And Don and Dunn's poem, uh, "I am a little world made cunningly." So here I'll, I'll read to you uh, Alabaster's poem. We'll talk about how it's metaphysical. This is number fifteen. My soul, a world, is by contraction. The heavens therein is my internal sense, moved by my will as an intelligence. My heart, the element. My love, the sun. And as the sun about the earth doth run and with his beams doth draw thin vapors thence, which after in the air do condense, and pour down rain upon the earth anon, so moves my love about the heavenly sphere, and draweth thence with an attractive fire, the purest argument wit can des desire, whereby devotion after man may arise. And these conceits, digest by thoughts, retire, and turn into April showers of tears. Um, interesting poem. Now, what makes it a metaphysical poem? And this is the kind of thing that later Dunn will take up in the other poets. Herb, Herbert probably less than Dunn, but Dunn definitely starts this, and this is why very often the metaphysical poets are called the school of Dunn, because he was so inventive with these metaphors, these conceits. So here, Albert says, My soul a world is by contraction. Now, this is, was kind of a radical move at this time. He's drawing on um, philosophical ideas of the, the, the macrocosm and the microcosm. But my soul, the world, is by contraction. The heavens therein is my internal sense. The heavens in the contraction are his internal sense. Moved by my will is an intelligence. My heart, the element. My love, the sun. Right. Now he's also part of the metaphor. Right, is uh, the way they understood the planets. Right, the planets were were the bodies of angelic beings, of the intelligences. Right, so the the planets 
showed you, and this is how, where, how astrology works, right? Is you understand, for instance, uh, the planet Venus is informed by a, a, a certain spiritual quality that it represents, and that I, that it not only represents but also uh, projects or you know sends down to the earth. Right, so you when you receive the, you know, wherever the the, the rays of the sun you know, or the or the moon or any of the planets, and depending on where they are in the zodiac, that influences the way the reception. This is why you know my world is my contraction. So the great world, you know, the macrocosm is reflected in kind of right in a, in a reciprocal relationship with the microcosm, and this is what he's drawing on, and now. This is takes poetry into this, you know, philosophical, theological direction, which was not typical. And they, they kind of press these metaphors. They stretch them. Now, Alabaster here does it to a certain degree. Dunn does it to a ludicrous speed. I mean, he really pulls them apart and really sees what they can they can do with these. Where can we take these ideas, and how can we? And why do they do this? Um, I would say, to, you know, Dunn especially, but Alabaster as well. They do this to shake us out of our complacent, uh, habit-formed ways of viewing the world. You know, that there are kind of get into your habit body. You know, you see, you, you see things the same way. Well, they, sometimes you need to be shaken awake. And this is what the metaphysical poets are trying to do. They're trying to shake you awake. And when we get to Herbert, you'll see Herbert's trying to draw us, our attention to how miraculous the grace of God is, in, in, even in the midst of affliction, how it's there, right? How in, in, in uh, Alabaster right here is showing us just kind of um, how we're kind of constituted physically and metaphysically to participate in in the universe and in in, in God who, who governs the universe, right? And you notice at the Volta, which is the last six lines here, is where he changes. They always say the Volta is like the but or the so, where it kind of changes perspective for us. So he says, so moves my love about the heavenly sphere and draweth thence with an attractive fire the purest argument wit can desire, whereby devotion after me arise, and these conceits digest by thoughts retire, are turned into April showers of tears. So what happened? He set up that beautiful metaphysical, you know, almost like uh, in Hamlet. In Hamlet, uh, there's one one of Hamlet's soliloquies. Uh, what a piece of work is a man! He starts. Look you, this firmament fretted with golden, fu golden fire. He gets all excited about the, the macrocosm, but, but he says, man delights not me. That's where Shakespeare goes. And Alabaster kind of does the same thing, right? And this is why he does a weird thing. And, you know, I haven't read too much criticism on, on this poem, but something that strikes me. Because if you'll notice in the Volta, and the sestet here. The, if you look at the last words in each line, it says sphere, fire, desire, arise, retire, tears. So sphere rhymes with retire and fire and word rhymes with desire and arise rhymes with tears. Um, what? No, it doesn't. It's an off rhyme. It's a really off rhyme. It's a slant rhyme. Why? Because he's showing you how it doesn't work completely. So moves my love about the heavenly sphere and draweth thence with an attractive fire the purest argument wit can desire. Right? I'm a purest argument wit can desire. And what is the purest argument wit can desire? Where do, whereby devotion may arise. So, which is Devotion is not an intellectual activity. The wit can only take you so far. 
and these conceits digest by thoughts retire or we, we would say digested and these conceits digest by thoughts retire retire are turned into April showers of tears so these are these are part of his penitential sonnets right so interesting he, without mentioning God in this poem or sin he brings us to this point pretty extraordinary work um, I mean there's a couple other things I want to talk before we, we, we finish up for today uh, another thing we're going to notice as we go through uh, this series of lectures in this course um, uh, is uh, the influence of devotional literature. You see a lot of that in, in, in uh, Suthal. And what was also circulate around at this time in, in print were all these devotional manuals like, uh, like St. Francois de Sales or Francis de Sales, right? He, he, uh, his devotional books were coming out and they were coming, and even though Francois, uh, St. Francois was, uh, was Catholic, they would publish these books but without somewhat well with the more Catholic parts kind of expunged and circulate them in for a Protestant readership because uh, the people were hungry for for this kind of devotional literature now that you know literacy rates were r rising and people wanted to know that, you know because now that with the Protestant Reformation people um, with the, and the idea in Protestantism is that you can read the Bible and interpret it for yourself. You don't need a priest to tell you what it means, which proved kind of tragic for Protestantism as well. But um, so there, this meditative tradition, Francois de Sales, uh, Louis de Granada was another one whose books were published in Protestant versions. But also, and probably the most important figure in this kind of meditative literature at this time was St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, to which uh, Suthel belonged. Um, and in Jesuit meditation, if you've ever read or even been on the, the spiritual exercises, the retreat, uh, it's an interesting uh, way to go about things where... Uh, which was it was kind of unheard of it was radical at the time it came out where the the director of the retreat builds the picture you you build an imaginative picture of events in christ's life or events of your own life you can you know it'll say i should I actually it would be nice if i could read something i don't know where my copy is uh, <laughs> i don't know where my copy of the exercises is but it'll say something like picture yourself at the foot of the cross look around what do you behold? You see his mother. You see the disciple John, right? Um, so you, he puts you in this emotional space. I mean, it's, he's using intellectual, you know, logic and language to place you into an emotional space, so you can participate in an imaginative way in the life of Christ. So it's called building the picture, right, and leading you into the the contemplation of of Christ's wounds or whatever. Christ's birth or whatever happens to be resurrection. And this is what uh, Suffolk does uh, very often in his poetry. And here's, I'll just read uh, the first stanza of Upon the Image of Death. Before my face the picture hangs. The daily should put me in mind of those, those cold, cold qualms and bitter pangs that short, shortly I am like to find. But yet, alas, full little I do think hereon that I must die. So this is straight out of this Jesuit uh, retreat, um, you know, the exercises of St. Ignatius. And these also circulated in kind of modified versions for a Protestant audience and also, for, of course, for a Catholic audience. So what we have with, uh, with Suthel is uh, this presence of uh, what we call the, the Ignatian tradition of spirituality, the Ignatian exercises. And uh, Louis Martz, in a book, I think it was written in 59, if 
I'm not mistaken, early 60s. Uh, the Poetry of Meditation. Wrote a, it's an important book on, on this topic, if you ever want to check, in, check into it. Um, and he may have overstated, like probably he certainly overstated, the importance of Ignatian spirituality over the whole period. But you can't deny it in, especially subtle, but uh, Alabaster as well had w was experienced with the Ignatian tradition, and so was John Donne. John Donne's two uncles were Jesuit priests. He was trained by Jesuit priests in, in, in hiding as a Catholic recusant. And so it's really present in there. Now, you could reject it, as later Donne rejected uh, Jesuits. <laughs> he really had a thing. I always think of post-traumatic stress disorder with John Donne. But nevertheless, you cannot deny this presence of Jesuit spirituality that permeates um, these English writers, especially the ones I just mentioned. And, and that uh, influence, to one degree or another, uh, per permeated through some of the other metaphysical poets. You don't see it as, it ch kind of changes over time, but this is early on, right? Where uh, the Jesuit anxiety that filled uh, English culture, you know, there were like maybe five Jesuits in the whole country. They were basically public enemy number one. And, because, and they were all accused of treason, oh, which is interesting. And they're not, not on, they weren't, when they were executed, they were executed for treason, not heresy. Um, and so, so that, and that's a good place to end, I think, is uh, just give us the background of where we go with the medical, physical poets. And I, and I th think uh, those, especially uh, Suffolk and the Sydney Psalter, kind of set the stage because you have the Catholic side. And you have the Protestant side, right? The Catholic side is really a devotional. And in fact, you could look at um, the English translations of the Bible as also reflective of this. Whereas uh, uh, the Geneva Bible, for instance, is a, was kind of a it's adorned with notes, and it was it was created in Geneva by exiles from Mary's England, and. Uh, it's filled with notes that are basically anti-Catholic uh, diatribes for most of the time. And uh, so that's one, you know, attempt to assert a, a English Protestant identity. But then, because that came out, the Catholics put out their version, the douay Reims version. And uh, there they tried to assert a Catholic English identity. So these two are, are kind of combating it. Uh, never totally resolved, but, but what happens with uh, 1616, I think it's 1616, with uh, the publication of uh, the authorized version, the King James Version of the Bible, it doesn't have any notes. And it doesn't have any notes for one reason, because James didn't like notes. And the reason he didn't like notes is because some of the notes in the Geneva Bible were very critical of his mother, who was Catholic. Mary Queen of Scots, right? So, uh, so it's an inter I mean, an interesting polarity right here with, you know, the Sydney Psalter, Geneva, auth authorized version, stream we can call it, and the subversive Jesuit, um, Catholic stream on the other side, and they both percolate through the metaphysical poets. That we'll be looking at it's certain, certainly in Crashaw. It's really heavy in Crash, but it's also probably a very unlikely person, uh, Henry Vaughn. It, it shows up in him as well, especially in the second half of Silex and Tillens. Well, we'll talk about those things when we get to them. And uh, I wish you well, and I'll see you next time when we talk about John Dunn.